that expresses their concern over the corrosive effect of money in politics. That happened in, the 19, in 2012. That's not far uh, in the past. Citizens are concerned about outside money. They're so concerned about outside money that less than 10% for the first time in the history of this country believe that the people who represent us in Congress can actually solve the problems that we face. That's a very disturbing indictment of the whole representative process, if you think about it for a moment. If we have any responsibility at all, it seems like it's to save the institution, to restore that kind of confidence. I believe that that's what Ken was after. You say he cared about the institution, but I think he cared about it in those terms. Not to worship it as God, but to think about the purpose of the institution. If we don't have the trust of the people that we propose to represent, how do we expect them to follow us? You ever ask yourself that question? We spend so much energy these days tearing one another down, that by the time we get elected, nobody trusts us. What are we doing? What's going on with our political system? George Washington maybe was right, you know, when he warned us about political parties. I was reminded when I came back here today, haven't been here in a while, that we've got this huge gap that separates us. We've got two microphones up here. Are we afraid we're going to catch something from the other microphone? And here I am talking into the right one, right? I wish that I, when I had been in politics, set the kind of example that Ken Gordon set. I had this beautiful speech here. Man, I worked on this thing. Lay into the night last night, up at 5.30 this morning, and I'm not even paying any attention to it. I apologize for that. But the thing that really impressed me about Ken was his independence. He was what is called an independent moral agency. One thing that we all care about, it would seem, uh, is being somewhat free. We talk about having a free society. I think the reason that he was so concerned about money and politics is because, while we'd like to think that it doesn't affect us, come on, come on. The lobbyists that give us the money must believe it affects our vote. It's an investment. They quit giving it to us if they didn't think it affected our vote. But we say, oh, it just gives us access, right? I'll listen to you to do that. I hope that when we have another representative in Congress that they're willing to take my telephone call. Maybe it's going to require me to write a big check before that happens. We have a system now that's awash in politics, and so our other excuse is what? We say you can't be competitive unless you take their money. I know this is uncomfortable, isn't it? That's what we say. We even insinuate that if you don't take their money, you're a little naive about the political process. I teach ethics now at the University of Denver and I have for 14 years. It's given me time to reflect on what I did here. Um, I took money from special interests and I had to listen to them. I remember one time we were voting uh, on a bill that had uh, some concern for some trial lawyers in town. And one of them had made a $500 donation to my campaign. I was voting the other way. And he came in and he was honest. He said, the reason you should vote with us is because we donated money to your campaign. And I said, well, can't you give me some rational reason why I should do that? There was this long silence, and he says, money's rational. 
Now money is speech, right? Thank you, Supreme Court of the United States. And between 2012 and 2014, money in politics increased by 400% from special interest. Our constituents do not believe us anymore when we tell them it's not persuasive. When we become, defend, when we become dependent upon that money to be here in this chamber and think that we're something special, are we still going to tell ourselves that it's not persuasive? Ken was a very interesting guy. I think of him as being an Aristotelian. Aristotle talks about what the real purpose of life is. He says it's not wealth. It's not the accumulation of power. Those are just means to an end. The end that we seek is happiness. And he used a fancy Greek word for it, and I won't burden you with that. But it's not really happiness. It's fulfillment. It's being proud of the life that you lead. <coughs> not having to apologize for anything that you do or you think. He said that the way that we become satisfied to that extent is we have to live a life that is virtuous. What does he mean by that, virtuous? Well, Aristotle was a practical philosopher. He always put things in the context of our work. He said, we need to figure out what the virtues are that make us do our work better. And he always put it in the context of utility for the community. That's our constituents. Senator Cassidy, uh, one minute remaining. <laughs> Sorry. Now I remember the house. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the better chamber. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I feel welcome. Um, this was Ken's authentic project, and he adopted uh, those virtues which he thought were important and would make him serve the people better. And eliminating conflicts of interest was high on his list. When a wealthy person dies, the people that are left behind, they fight over the money. That's what he leaves. When a man of power dies, the people that are in line fight over the power. But you know, when a man of principle dies, the whole community feels that there's a hole that's left. And we're left with the question, who now will sacrifice their own self-interest to do this work? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate your patience. Thank you, Senator. President Schaefer.